Judges chapter number 1 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered uh, the land into his hand. And Judah said unto Simeon his brother, Come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him. And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they slew of them in Bezek ten thousand men. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and they fought against him. And they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him, and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table, as I have done, so God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it and had smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain and in the south and in the valley. You may be seated. I'm going to ask Brother Thomas Caldwell, if you would, would you pray for us this evening that God would have his will and way in the preaching. Yes. Think about the people today that have gone through some battles and storms and facing great trouble. I pray that you can help each person to look to you. The Bible says, I lift up my eyes under the hills when things come in my head. And I'm glad I have come from you. I'm glad you use people and your work and for your service. And I pray for everyone that's here and each one that has a need that they will be supplied. That there will also be a desire to distribute what we receive to other people for your glory. Whatever is needed, I pray that you will help the people to see their need. And may everyone look to you. We look to the world, we look to the politicians, we look to churches, but thank God we can look to Calvary and see where you have been given victory and power and grace and glory. And may Christ be glorified here tonight. And we thank you for all you've done what you've given us, and thank you also for what you've kept us from receiving that we deserve. I pray that you touch each heart, save some soul or any person that's lost. They need Jesus Christ more than they need money, fame, and fortune. I pray that you bless Brother Austin as he preaches the Word of God, and may the listeners listen with attentive hearts and ears for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Uh, as you know here, I'm going to take just a moment and review before we get into uh, our new thought for this evening. Uh, but here in Judges chapter number 1, uh, as you know, we've mentioned before that this is a very unique spot uh, for the children of Israel to be in. It's a very uh, unique time frame in their history. And that is because uh, they are without a clear leader by the time you come into verse number 1. We've already dealt with that. Uh, but Moses died at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, he passed the baton, if you will, of leadership to Joshua. And then in Joshua, the last chapter of Joshua, chapter 24, beginning in verse number 29 through the end of that chapter in verse 33, we find the death of Joshua. And so now Israel is without a leader uh, that has been clear, and so they must go to the Lord and ask the Lord uh, how they are to move forward uh, with the military conquest that Joshua had begun under the leadership of the Lord, but had not been able to finish during his lifetime. And so we've been looking at the thought that we find here in this verse as they were seeking the Lord as to how to move on, how to continue in the fight, how to move forward in the fight. And that's been our subject for the last couple of Wednesday nights is how to move forward in the fight. And we saw that in verse number 1, the first thing 
is that you need to go to ask him. Verse number 1 says, Now after the death of Joshua it came to pass, that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first and to fight against them? So when we cut that first verse, uh, they, they're asking the Lord for His direction. They're asking the Lord for a leader because uh, the Bible said that they asked who shall go up uh, to fight against the Canaanites first. Who is going to lead us there? Who is going to go before us there? So they're asking the Lord for His direction. They're asking the Lord for a leader. And the Bible gives them their answer. The Lord gives them the answer in verse number 2 where the Bible said that the Lord said Judah shall go up. And then the second thing, not only did they need to go to asking, but then they needed to go up against. If you're going to go forward in the fight, you've got to have a determination uh, that you're going to stand against the enemies of God. Right. And so we see that there in verse number 1, where the Bible said their question was, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites? The Canaanites were the enemies of God. Throughout this chapter, we find many uh, that are mentioned as the enemies of God. You find the Canaanites. You find the Perizzites. Uh, you find Adonai Bezek and many others that are mentioned uh, throughout this chapter as being uh, the enemies of God. And I'm glad to report to you that as we look through this chapter, you do find the enemies of God being defeated. You do find them right. being contended against. You do find the children of Israel doing what they needed to do to go forward and to conquer the land that God would have for them. They did choose to go up against. And then the last two weeks we've been looking at the thought of allies. How not only do you need to go to asking if you're going to move forward, getting the Lord's direction, finding out which way He would have for you to go, and if there is a need to look for a leader like they did here, uh, to get uh, all of those, uh, those questions that you need answered to go forward, you get them answered, and so that way you'll have, uh, you'll have uh, God's mind on the situation. So they had to uh, go to asking, they had to go up against, they had to have that determination, uh, that we are going to fight. That we're not just going to stay here, but we're going to go forward. And by going forward, that means that there's some enemies that are needed to be contended against. But then the third thing that we saw was that you needed to go with some allies. And that's what the Bible says in verse number 3. The Bible said that once Judah had received uh, the word from the Lord that he was to lead the children of Israel... The Bible said in verse number 3, And Judah said unto Simeon his brother, Come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him. And so with me in verse number 3, with thee in verse number 3, and with him. And it identifies to us that they were allied together. They were working together. They were fighting together. And so we looked at that a little bit last week and we began to talk about allies and being allied together. Uh, the first the first subject that we looked at a couple of weeks ago was we uh, looked at Paul's example in his ministry uh, of those that we uh, of those that Paul fought with, his allies that he fought with, men like Onesimus, men like Tychicus and others that were mentioned there. Uh, John Mark was mentioned there. And so he had some allies that caused him to be able to say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. But then last week we began to look at the church and how the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're looking for someone to ally with you, to stand with you and with, uh, when the battle is on and the heat is turned up and you need uh, some help to go forward, there's no better place to find those that you need to stand with when you are in great need than right here in the house of God. Amen. And so we looked last week at how the church is the ally of every believer. Uh, you have a group of people right here in the house of God that will stand with you during the toughest times of your life when the devil is fighting against you and he is hurling his uh, fiery darts at you and he's got uh, his bow and right at you and your family. Thank God that there is a church right here by the side of the road where you can come and you can know that we'll have a room full of people that are ready to take what's ready to take up arms 
against the devil as he tries to destroy you and your family. Amen. Amen. And so the church is the ally of every believer in a world that is trying to get away from church membership. In a world that is trying to get away from having your local church where you attend and where you uh, join with them and you stand with them and you uh, come and every week hear the same preacher and are around the same people and grow as a family in a world that hates that and says just go where you want. Go whatever church you want, hear whatever preacher you want, doesn't matter what kind of Bible they preach, no matter what kind of standards they have, you just go whatever feels best, and you can go here today and there tomorrow, and there's no dedication, there's no, there's no faithfulness in this day, and the world that says that, thank God, we know, according to this Bible, that there is a place where God wants us to be, right. and that this place does, to contrary to what the world says, having the same church and the same people and the same family that you can ally together with is a benefit to the believer. Amen. One of the greatest, uh, one of the most beautiful aspects of the Christian life is being a part of God's local New Testament church. Amen. Amen. And so we see that the local church was supposed to be a place where we have some allies and it is at the church that we have a place of supply where the members can supply parts that we cannot supply. They can minister in ways that we cannot. They can do things for us that maybe others in our life cannot because God has equipped them to do that. Amen. That's 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. But then not only is the church a place of supply, but according to the book of Acts, the church was ordained and designed in its original design to be a place of supplication. Was it not that Jesus was it not Jesus that said that his house was meant to be a house of prayer and not a den of thieves? Amen. We come in on Wednesday night, we have prayer. This is our Wednesday night prayer meeting, and prayer does have a special place in our services, especially on Wednesday night. We try to have a special emphasis on prayer in every service, but especially on Wednesday night because this place is supposed to be a place of prayer. And so when you come to church, you're finding a place of supply, you're finding a a place of supplication or prayer and then you find a place of support. That there's people here to support us and bear one another's burdens. Amen. And so we see that. But with that being said, let me mention one more thought on this at this uh, aspect of having allies that I failed uh, to mention last week and then we'll move on uh, to our new thought for this evening. Uh, notice with me in verse uh, in verse number uh, verse number uh, four the Bible said, And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And so that they slew of them in Bezek ten thousand men. Verse number five. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. In verse number four, and in verse number 5, when victory is obtained, God said it was Judah and it was Simeon who had acquired that victory. It was those men that were responsible for the victory. Now look with me at verse number, uh, let's see here, verse number 16. Notice what the Bible said. And the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of palm trees with uh, the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lieth in the south Arad, and they went and dwelt among the people. And Judah went with Simeon his brother, and they slew the Canaanites that inhabited uh, Zephath, and utterly destroyed it again. Uh, we find them being given uh, the, being given the credit. For the victory. When we look at these verses, we look at Judah as the leader and Simeon allying with Judah. Uh, we even see uh, these men, uh, uh, these men allying themselves together. They fought together. They got the victory together. Verse 3 said, Simeon asked for Judah, and Judah chose. To, uh, no, excuse me. Uh, verse 3 says that Judah asked for Simeon, 
And Simeon chose to ally with Judah and to fight with Judah. Verse number 16 says that it wasn't just Judah and it wasn't just Simeon. But verse 16 says now there's a new group of people that the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro. Uh, the Bible said that that group went out of the city of uh, palm trees with the children of Judah. And the Bible said that they together went and dwelt among the people. And they slew, verse 17, the Canaanites together. So you find that Judah being allied with Simeon, you find that the children of the Kenites are allying with Judah and Simeon. Uh, but it's not just human, it's not just uh, these men, uh, these human uh, men that are allying together. We look at uh, our churches, we look at people, we look at relationships, we look at one man to another man, one lady uh, to another lady. Uh, but notice that in verse number 1 and 2, we find that it was God's will for Judah to leave. Right. In verse number 3, uh, uh, verse number 3, we see where the Bible said, uh, for, well, let me back up a minute. Let's learn it said, Judah shall go up. The Bible said it was God's will for Judah to go and to lead in the fight. However, verse 3, uh, this whole chapter would have been very different if Judah would not have chosen to not just ally with Simeon later on in the verse, but he begins by allying himself with God and His will. You see, when somebody when somebody obeys the Lord, they're saying that I am willing to do what you want. I'm willing to do your bidding. I'm willing to follow your direction. Judas said, "God, I'm choosing to jump on uh, jump on board with you. I'm choosing to follow your plan, and I am an ally with you that you can trust to do your will." Now let me ask you this this evening. Can God uh, get that same kind of reaction from you and I? God said, I want you to do this. I want you to live this way. Throughout the Word of God, we find thousands of commandments from the Lord. God wants us to live this way. God wants us to tell people His Word. God wants us to uh, do many different things that He calls upon us not to give us a list of rules just to have something uh, for us to do. God is not interested in our religiosity. God is not interested in us going through acts of formalism. The reason why God said what He said is so you and I will be obedient and so you and I will end up having blessed lives because of it. Right. Right. When we find Judah in verse number 3 agreeing to do the will of God, he allies himself with the God uh, that is about to allow him and the nation of Israel to see his blessings. And this chapter is, is filled with blessings from God. Now, I, I do hate to see, say this, and we'll look at this more in just a few minutes, uh, but this chapter is also filled with a lot, of, uh, a lot of broken promises and a lot of burdens from the children of Israel. This is meant to be a book of victory, but we find out that this book at, in, in, as a whole is a book of uh, uh, is a book of rebellion, is a book of uh, disobedience when men did that which was right in his own eyes. We find in this chapter God beginning to try to develop things the way that he wanted them to be. But then later on we find the judges having to be instituted because this group failed. This group disobeyed. This group didn't do what God wanted them to do. And you see, there is something to be said about us allying together. And I want to be your ally. And I want you to be my ally. Amen. I want to be here to support you. I want to be here to strengthen you. I want to be here to pray for you. And I hope you want to be here for me. And to pray for me. And to strengthen me. And those relationships in church are great. And those human, human uh, allies being allied together, standing together, fighting together, and there's great benefits from that. But when was the last time we ever thought about being God's ally? Amen. Yes. Standing with Him. Yes. When was the last? See, God had a will for the nation of Israel. God had a plan full of blessings for them. But because they only partially obeyed, then you find Him 
having to back up, give the judges, uh, institute the judge. See, the judges were never God's will for the nation of Israel. That's right. It was not, not saying that God in His sovereignty didn't already know what they were going to do. I believe that He did. I believe He sees the end from the beginning. I believe He understood that. But that was not what He wanted them to do. Right. God would have much rather them continue getting the victories, having Judah as their leader, following through with these military conquests, and then seeking His will for further direction once all of the enemies have been defeated. And once all of their enemies were uh, vanquished and, sl and slain. Amen. But we find here Judah allying with God and beginning a process that would cause great victory yeah. in the future. Friend, you'll never be able to see victory spiritually in your life until you get beyond just a, a lot of people look at these human relationships and say, I have a pastor, I have an assistant pastor, I have a Sunday school teacher, I, I have a church family, I do this and I do that and I have good Christian friends and that should be okay. But friend, the physical relationships, while they are good, will not be able to do it by, by itself. You have got to choose to be and to be an ally of God. Right. Say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm at your disposal for you. Amen. Whatever your will is for me, you sign me up. Judah here did not, did not ask God any questions. He did not give God any stipulations. He did not tell God, well, I will go up for you if you will do this for me. God said, Judah shall go up. And then the Bible said in verse number 3 that Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me. You know, Judah's decision there is not even mentioned in Scripture. The very next phrase, God said, I want Judah to do this. Judah already had his mind made up. And in the very next verse, we find him making a plan already as their leader to lead them in a more productive way of battle. That's what a leader does. Not even one verse, he is already leading them by allying together with Simeon to fight the good fight of faith, to fight against the enemies of God. Amen. And so we see this, that they, uh, that Judah had a choice to make. Judah chose to lead. He allied himself with God and His will. And therefore, listen to this, because Judah chose to ally himself with God, he was already someone that Simeon could join up with and know that he would be led in the right direction. Let me tell you this. Don't expect to have very many allies, very many people standing with you if you're not willing to ally with God first. Right. Amen. Good. This is something that every pastor in America needs to understand. Yes. This is something that every Sunday school teacher needs to understand. Right. This is something every deacon needs to understand. This is something every church body needs to understand. You want people to follow you. You want people to believe what you tell them. You want people to. Uh, you want people to believe what you're saying about the Lord. You first have to choose to be God's ally to stand with Him, no matter where He leads. Judah here is knowing that when he says yes to God, he's going to a battlefield. He knows that when he says yes to God, he may be the leader today, but he may not be alive tomorrow. He's going to fight God's enemy. He's going to fight people uh, that in, in, in humanistic standpoint are stronger than they are, are more plenteous than they are. But he said, if it's the will of God, I'm going to go. If it's what God wants, I'm going to do what God wants. And then the rest of the children of Israel now had a man that they could follow because he had chosen. I'm choosing God in His way first. And that will, that will go a long way with those who are watching our Christian lives, with those who are looking at us to find some kind of answer from God, to find out what true Christianity looks like. And by the way, from the best Christian in this room to the most unfaithful Christian in this room, there are people that are watching your life and they're getting their doctrine from you and they're getting their understanding of God from you and what the saving power of the gospel is to them is exactly what they see it as in your life That's right. every single day. Yes, sir. Are you going to ally yourself with God and thereby be someone that someone can, uh, someone can ally with 
uh, that they can get something from? Uh, or are you going to be uh, like many others have been? And they're just going to be you going to be like uh, in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira. They're only going to go so far. They're only going to give God this much. And we know what happened to them because of it. Amen. Amen. We see here that allying is not just us with each other, but it is also us with God. Amen. Because they allied with God, God allowed them to receive honor. He mentioned their names in this scripture. He gave them uh, that He gave them credit for uh, for fighting the battles. Amen. And so uh, we see this. We see the. Uh, uh, fighting these battles. We see them allying together. But let me give you this last thought and then we'll be done this evening. Not only did they need to, uh, not only did they need to go to asking in verse number 1, they needed to go up against in verse number 1. They needed to go with some allies in verse number 3 and 4. But then in verse number 5 through the rest of the chapter, we find that they need to go doing that which is appropriate. Look at verse number 5. The Bible says they found Adonai, Bezek, and Bezek, and they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And Adonai, Bezek fled, and they pursued after him, and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adonai, Bezek said three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table as I have done. So God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Think about this. In Judges chapter number 1, uh, this, it began as a chapter uh, of great victories. We find uh, these victories, amazing victories, amazing things happening for the children of Israel up to this point. They responded correctly, even though they were filled with grief after losing their leader Joshua. I'd say that's a great victory for their life. Amen. Because too many of us are defeated by grief, heartbreaking situations, having our minds and hearts plagued with things that we cannot control. And those things captivate us and they defeat us. And it's Hard to go forward uh, when you're facing that much in your life. There may be somebody here this evening. You've got a situation right now that has paralyzed you from being able to go forward for God. And you're here, you're faithful, but you're not progressing. You're not going forward. You're not doing much more than you're doing right now because there's a situation in your life that has paralyzed your service for the Lord. The children of Israel here did not uh, get caught up in that. They did not become paralyzed even though their hearts were broken, even though they were in an uncertain situation, even though they were without leadership, they didn't get defeated. So that's a great victory. They did not lose their sense of direction. They did not lose their drive. They did not lose their desire for conquest. Their number one priority is if Joshua is going to be dead and he's going to be in the ground and he's not going to be able to do what he has led us to do for all of these years and what we have followed him as he did all of these years. We're going to continue what he started. We're going to continue the fight that he was fighting until the day that he left this world. They said one way that we can pay homage to our faithful leader is to do what he led us to do and to fight the fight that he led us to fight. And so they, did, they were determined to not be paralyzed by their grief for him. They, but they were not going to lose their desire. They were going to fight. They were going to. Uh, they were going to. Uh, they were going to uh, have conquest forward. They didn't slow down. They sought God's direction for the sole purpose of how. To keep going for His glory. Right. They said yes to God's will. And this day, and it's getting fewer and far between to find people that are willing to do that. Amen. Right. Right. They faithfully followed God's leader. They fought with everything they had. And they began to see the Lord give them their first victories after Joshua's death. Think about that. Because they said yes to God, their leader was gone. God had moved them forward. And despite all of the pains 
that would have been involved in the new leadership and the decision to go forward and trying to get that massive group of people to go forward together with the same mind and in one accord fighting and standing together against the enemies of God. What we find is, is they did it, they accomplished it, and now when we come to these verses, we find them already beginning to see victory. The first victories without Joshua. Can you imagine what that probably would have meant to this group of people? They, they knew how to win battles under Moses. They knew how to win battles with a leader like Joshua. And now they're seeing their first victories on their own. The, the investments of Moses and Joshua were not, uh, they were not in vain. They were not uh, void of, uh, of, of, of having uh, producing results. Now what they're seeing is the results of those men's investment uh, in, this, in this group of people. They fought that with everything they had. And they saw the first victory since Joshua's death. Think about these victories. Verse number 4, the Bible said that they slew 10,000 Canaanites and Perizzites in Beza. That's verse number 4. In verse number 5 through 7, they defeated the infamous Adonai Bezek in Bezek. And by the way, both of those are victories. Them, uh, you defeat 10,000 men, I'd say that's a great victory. Amen. The Bible said they slew them. Yeah. Uh, they, 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 they killed them. And therefore, there was no, there was going to be no more attack from them ever against the armies of God. Those ten thousand men would never be able to stand up again and curse at their God, be able to stand against their God or anything uh, that God uh, smiled upon. Amen. So they were eliminated. But then they find in Adonai Bezek, there's a man that is famous for his. Uh, for his uh, uh, for his brutality, verse number seven says that Adonai Bezek said three score and ten kings having their thumbs and great toes cut off gathered their meat under my table. You know what he's doing when he says this? He's bragging about his conquests. He's coming to the time where he is about to be finished, where he is the one that is being vanquished. And so what he is doing here is he's walking down memory's lane and saying, "These guys got me." But this is what all of these men were not able to defeat me. And I was not able to be defeated until this day. He's talking about uh, his victories. And these men, despite how infamous he was for his brutality. And we read these verses and it's almost awkward to read uh, because of how brutal this Adonai Bezek was. He was not interested in just killing uh, those that opposed him. He wanted to mutilate them and humiliate them. This is the kind of man that God has allowed them uh, to uh, defeat, that He has led them to and given them the power uh, to be victorious over. I would say that's a great victory. That seven kings had lost, but thank God, Israel had prevailed. This ragtag bunch of misfits from the wilderness, God had turned them into a mighty army. And now, uh, just on the will of God, and just on the direction of God, they are fighting. Uh, they are fighting without their infamous leaders, Moses and Joshua, and they're getting great victories for the cause of Christ. Amen. For the things of God. Yes, they saw victories in Jerusalem in verse number 8. They saw a mighty victory in Zephath of the Canaanites in verse number 7 and verse number seven, or verse number 9 and verse number 17. In verse number 18, it speaks of their victories in Gaza, Escalon, and Ekron. These victories, all of the, uh, uh, from verse number 4 to verse number 18, they were delivered victories. God had delivered these victories into the hand of the children of Israel. The army of Judah in our text is strong and bold. Uh, they are very capable, capable militarily. Uh, but the victory, the Bible says, is the Lord's and is not Judah's. God delivered uh, the Canaanites into their hand. He had given them the ability to destroy them. He had put it in their power, not just the Canaanites, but every enemy they face. You study this text, you'll find out God had His hands in every victory that they received. And verse number 4 declares that it was the Lord that delivered them into their hand. So God is the one 
and is to be given the credit for these victories. Right. He gave them the ability to do it. And by the way, I believe that's something that this world is failing to recognize. Yes. That everything we... And by the way, our churches are just as bad as anyone else mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to what, the, what we see in the house of God is not by our own strength or by our own power, but it comes from the power of God. Amen. Right. Amen. It's God that delivers it, these things in our hand. Yes. It is God that enables and gives us the ability to do what we see done for right. the glory of God. Right. So they were delivered victories, but they were also direct victories. God delivered them into their hand, but God also put them in the right place to deal with the right enemies at the right time. Yes. I, I feel like you can, I don't think we can see this any better than in Adam and Bezek. The Bible said that they found him in Bezek. You see, Bezek was the place to where they slew those 10,000 men. They were already there fighting against other enemies of the Canaanites and the Perizzites. They were already fighting other men, but there they found that infamous one among their ranks. The Bible said they found him. It was, not, it was not the fact that uh, before that moment that they, as far as we can tell from the text, they had not been seeking for Him. But the Bible said that when they uh, were faithful to fight the enemies that God directed them to, God directed them to Him, and they got the victory over Him. So these were delivered victories. These were direct victories. And by the way, can I say this? And you could probably preach a whole sermon just in that experience with Adam and Bezek. But can I say, when we see the brutality of what happened with him, and whether you agree with it or not, the children of Israel did to him exactly what he had been doing to so many others when he had made it his calling card uh, to cut off the toes and the big toes and the uh, thumbs of the hand of uh, all of the enemies that he defeated. What the children of Israel did to him was exactly what he had been doing to others. And whether you agree with that or not, guess what the Bible says? That's what I believe with all my heart. The Bible is letting us know the great danger that it is to set yourself up as an enemy of God. Yes, sir. Amen. That's right. You set yourself up against the Lord and you try. You set yourself up against the Word of God and the things of God and you say, I'm willing to be God's enemy and I'm willing to oppose Him and stand against Him. Friend, don't be long. It won't be long. Don't, uh, don't be surprised when God deals with you very harshly uh, and, and when God allows things into your life uh, that, that seem very, very hard. Because the Bible said it took that for them to defeat this man. But we see here this man, uh, Adam Ibizek, while he is a great, he is a great lesson uh, to us about setting ourselves up as an enemy of God. We've seen the delivered victories God delivered them in their hand. We've seen the directed uh, victories God directed them to the right people at the right time so that they could win in the battle. And God set them up against this man, Adam Ibizek. Because he had made himself an enemy of God. And he's a lesson in fighting the wrong enemy. He should not have been fighting against the children of God. He should have been fighting with the children of God. Amen. Uh, but not only were these delivered victories. And direct victories. But here's my final thought for this evening. They, they went from. Now this is the sad, sad testimony of the rest of this chapter. From what we've seen up to this point. It seems like there's been one victory after another. A very positive text. The children of Israel doing that which is right. That God, uh, that God expected of them. But they went from having delivered victories and direct victories to having defaulted victories. The victories, in other words, that God wanted them to have. But they missed out on because they failed to continue in what He had told them to do. Go with me please with, uh, to the book of Deuteronomy this evening. Deuteronomy chapter number 20. Deuteronomy chapter number 20. I want you to see what God had commanded them just a couple of books over. This was still God's law in the time frame of our text. This is still what God expected of them. This was the law that they had been given when it comes to uh, to warfare, if you have a, a Schofield Bible, uh, in the uh, right underneath verse number twenty, uh, the heading is given the law of warfare. So this is the law that God had given the children of Israel on how to go to war 
with his enemies, with enemy nations. Put with me in Deuteronomy 20 and verse number 16. And, and by the way, some of the names that we've been mentioning in Judges chapter number 1 are mentioned here in this text. And this, no doubt, would have been during the time of Moses. Moses giving the law from God to his people and uh, to the children of Israel. This is what God told Moses to write down. He said, but of the cities of the people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth. I believe that's as plain as it can be. God said when you and God delivers an enemy nation into your hand, you make sure that you utterly destroy them. Do not leave anything that breathes alive. Man, woman, child, beast, do not leave anything that breathes alive. And by the way, that can sound pretty harsh, but that is exactly what was necessary for the children of Israel to have victory. And I believe, you know, we, we look at some of the things that God did in the Old Testament as being very hard. Uh, but what He was doing here is protecting His children. Protecting them physically. Protecting them ideologically. Protecting them spiritually. And I don't think there's one person in this room this evening that would say that when it comes to your child, whether it is their ideology and the way that they think, or whether it is their emotions, whether it is their whether it is their theology, uh, their belief, uh, when it comes to spiritual things, you would stop at no end to make sure that they believe right and their minds are preserved and they're physically safe. I don't know about you, but I'm going to do everything it takes to keep my children safe. Yes, sir. Yes. Amen. Right. On a physical standpoint. Oh, I believe every parent in here would say, I'd be willing to give my life yes, to make sure my child is safe. I believe everyone in here would say that. Right. Would fight, would, would war uh, to, the, uh, to the end if that's what it took to keep my family safe. Yes. I believe we'd all say that. And here in this text, God's going to the, uh, going to the uh, nth extreme because He knows that His children is not just, this is not just ideology, but ideological. This is physical for them as well. They're going to be in physical warfare with these people. There's, these children could lose their life and many of them will fighting. And He said, if you're going to fight, you need to make sure that there's no way for them to come back. It hurts you again. That's fine. Amen. If you're going to fight to the death to an enemy keeping your children saved, then why would it? Why? Uh, would, why would you leave enough of them around so they can come back and try again? Right. Work up their numbers again and try and come back to it again. That's foolish. Right. But I believe one of the main reasons is not just the physical end of it. But I believe if you study the Old Testament, you'll find out that one of the reasons why God commanded this is to keep uh, their wicked, ungodly, unspiritual, uh, idea, uh, 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 idolatrous belief systems, religions out from among His people. Right. And I also believe that every parent in here will do anything you can to keep the world's influence off of your children or by or at least you should be that way. I know we we have a lot of people in our churches now that you let, they'll let their kids watch whatever they want to and listen to whatever music they want to listen to and go they, wherever they want wherever they want to go and hang out with whoever they want to hang out with and whatever influence influences them is fine and whatever books they want to read is fine and whatever trash they want to put in their mind and in their heart is fine. But if you call yourself a Bible believer, you call yourself a Christian, you say that you love the Lord and you want to raise your children and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, then you ought to do everything you can. And those of you that already have grown children, you don't have to stop with just them being under your roof. You can still have a part in trying to help them and lead them and guide them. Uh, but the Bible says here that God was going to make sure that with everything that He could in His law, He was going to tell them to keep out all of those all of those, uh, uh, those idolatrous uh, uh, folks out of the nation of Israel. Now, I, I don't understand why we have children and when they're shortly after they're born, we'll bring them into the house of God, we'll bring them up to the preacher before the whole church 
and say, Preacher, I want to dedicate my baby to God. And I want, I want God to be in this child's life. I want to uh, raise this baby in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And then after that dedication service, the parenting mm -hmm. that follows does everything it can to hand that hand that baby that's been dedicated to God over to this lost and wicked world. Yes, it doesn't make sense to me. You're right. Amen. Yes. When, we, when, when there is a baby dedication in this church, I hope not only is the parent saying that I'm willing to commit uh, to raise this child, but then our church will also be willing to commit to be what we ought to be, me as the pastor, to be what I ought to be, you as the membership. And those of that child, what we preached just a minute ago, is going to ally with spiritually, and they're going to look at your life, and you're going to be teaching them either, uh, either in classes or just by the way you live your life. You're going to be teaching them what a Christian looks like and how a Christian live. You need to determine with that parent that I too am going to stand and I'm going to do what God would have for me to do as far as the raising for this child. Even though it's not mine but it belongs to somebody in God's family. I'm going to do what I can to make sure they're raised right as well. Amen. Right. God's protecting His children here. He said don't leave any of them alive. Verse number 16. Verse 17. But thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites. Is that not who they're fighting all up in mm -hmm. Judges chapter number 1? The whole chapter they're fighting against the Canaanites. And the Perizzites, we've heard that. The Hivites and the Jebusites as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. That they teach you not to do after all their abominations. God tells them why which they have done unto their gods, their little G-O-D, idolatrous gods. So should, uh, so should ye sin against the Lord your God. He said, if you do not do this part of the law, you're sinning against God. If you choose to leave some alive of these groups, you're sinning against the Lord. And in Judges chapter number 1, we find... Them going to battle against the Canaanites and the Perizzites, two groups that are mentioned there in the law, Moses' law in Deuteronomy chapter number 20. They had been given victory, but they failed to obey God's law in Deuteronomy 20, 16 through 18. They should have killed many of their enemies in this chapter, but instead they let them go. The book of Judges teaches us how these compromises allowed these heathen nations to become thorns in their sides and enemies for years to come. Think about this now. Uh, think about what's being said here uh, in, in, in these verses. Notice in verse number, uh, let's see here, but let's notice in verse number uh, 18. The Bible said, And Judah took Gaza with the coast thereof. All of the previous verses have been victory. Them defeating and going to the next enemy. Verse 18 all says, Also Judah took Gaza with the coast thereof, and Ascalon with the coast thereof, and Ekron uh, with the coast thereof. And the Lord was with Judah. The Lord was with him. The Lord had His hand on him. And he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. Notice that phrase, could not, in verse number 19. Now let me ask you this question. And uh, I've read commentaries that I have different uh, ideas on this, but I'm just going to tell you, I pulled away from the commentaries. I didn't read any of, I didn't read any of them that I agreed with, so I decided to push back from them Amen. and just try my best to tell you what I feel like God put on my heart when I read this. Amen. Notice the Bible said that the Lord, y'all stay with me for a few more minutes and we'll be done. The Bible says that the Lord was with Judah. The Lord was present with him, enabling him to do the battle that he was about uh, to face there in those mountains. The Lord was with him, caused him to drive out the inhabitants of the mountain, but it said, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. Now you answer me this. If God is with them, and God is enabling them, then how is it that they truly could not do what they could not do there in verse number 19. 
Is God with them or not? The Bible says He is. Then why is it that they could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley? I'd like to submit to you, I don't believe it was God's fault. Amen. 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 I don't believe it was God's fault. Right. The Bible said they couldn't do it because they had chariots of iron. And I don't believe that there's ever been a chariot of iron, even that fortified chariot that would uh, have stricken fear in the hearts of the children of Israel, who, by the way, did not have any kind of artillery like that. I believe the reason why they could not is because of fear. I believe that their fear called them to stop trusting in the yes. God that was yes. with them. In this text, there are three things that I believe called them to stop fighting the enemies. Uh, the way that God told them to fight them. Look at this. Number one was fear. They could not. Now, think about this. and I'm hurrying through a lot of material. Verse number 19 says that they could not. Look at verse number 21. And the children of Benjamin... Did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. They had exchanged could not because of fear and exchanged it for did not. By the way, in your Christian life, there's going to be things that because of fear you will feel like you can not do for God's glory. And if you allow the fear uh, to take control of you, it will be that you care not, and the reason why is because you won't. Right. Could your could not will be replaced with did not. The reason why the rest of them did not is because there was one that said even though we have God on our side, we cannot because of this, uh, these chariots of iron, these physical, uh, these physical maladies that are causing us to take a step back and say we cannot. God, instead of trusting God to pursue them forward in these chariots of iron, they just said out of fear, we cannot drive it. And the Bible does still say that I can do all things for Christ would strengthen me. Right. Let me encourage you. How are you going to go forward in the fight? Don't let fear stop you from trusting in the God that has caused you to win every victory that you have ever won for the glory of God. Every spiritual victory that you've ever had. Do not let the sights and the things around you, do not let the fear that it brings stop you from trusting God with the rest. Amen? Fear. Number two, let me say this. Not only did they stop going forward because of fear, but I believe they stopped going forward because of focus. Look at verse number 25. The Bible said, or verse 24 said, The spy saw, I saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show thee mercy. And when he showed them the entrance in the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword. By the way, this is one of the enemies of God. The Bible said in verse 29, But they let go the man and all his family. Is that what God told them to do in Deuteronomy chapter number 20? No. Let me tell you what happened. Not only for the one for the one group of folks that are battling fear stopped them, but here they chose to amend for them their their uh, obedience to what God said because of their focus. See, a lot of people will look at a situation and say, "There's no way that God would be against." despite already having God's mind uh, declared unto them. By the way, that's what this Bible is. It's God's mind on paper. Right. This is not all that God knows. This is all God, but uh, this is all God wanted us to yes. know. Yeah. This is everything He wants you to know. Amen. This is everything Amen. He wants you to understand about Him. Right. And if He's already declared, you don't need you need to utterly destroy those enemies. It doesn't matter what the situation is, and it doesn't matter what the terms of this agreement was. They saw this man that was hospitable to them. Uh, they saw this man that showed them the entrance into the city, and more than that. They saw his family and they said, God would not be against me showing mercy to this group because they were so good to us. But God's word was already declared. His will was already made plain to them. And in this, they disobeyed 
And according to Deuteronomy chapter number 20, they sinned against the Lord. Don't let the, not only fear, but also don't let your focus stop you from obeying God. Because if you let your focus stop you, you will not be able to go forward in the fight for the things of God. Right. You will not be able to see another victory until you align your focus, despite what the world, despite what it looks like in the world, despite what your mind thinks about, well, this is okay and that is okay. And I wonder if a little of this is all right. And I wonder if a little of that is okay. And, and, and you know, it, it won't be mad. It won't be bad to miss uh, every once in a while, or it won't be. It won't be bad to uh, you know miss my prayer time or my Bible reading time. Just a little bit, friend. If you miss your focus being aligned with what God has already said, you will not move forward. You will not see another victory. You will not grow spiritually until you get your focus aligned with what God has already said. Yes, yes. They stop because of fear. They stop because of focus. And then, lastly, they stop because of finances. The Bible says, look at the end of verse number 30. Well, let's look at verse 28. The Bible said in the end of verse number 28, uh, it says that, that uh, they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. That's verse 28. Verse 30 says, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries. Verse uh, number 33 says that Beth Shemesh and Bethanath became tributaries unto them. Verse number 35 says, so, they, so, so that they became tributaries. The Bible here says that the children of Israel started letting people go that God told them to destroy. That tributary means that they would pay tribute to them. Means that they would give financial, they would give financial stability to the nation of Israel. They would pay them for their being allowed to live in God's land, in the land of Israel's inheritance. It was not God's will for those people to live there. They said, "Well, there's money in it, and therefore I'll, I will take I, I will take a step away from God's declared will and His purpose for me." And I will do what I see is right. I will get these. I will get these finances. I will get this this tribute money, and it calls them for the rest of the existence of this nation, fighting enemies that they never should have fought, fighting people that they should have never been having to face again. They missed out on complete victories that God desired for them to win. And Israel was never the same because of it. They were fighting things that should have been killed long ago. And by the way, let me close with this. If you're taking notes, you can write down Colossians 3, 5 through 11. Colossians 3, 5 through 11. Romans chapter number 8, verse number 13. And Hebrews chapter number 12, and verse number 1 through 3. And all three of those passages of Scripture... The Bible tells us things that we need to put to death in our life. We already dealt with several months ago, dealt with Colossians 3, preached through the, the whole chapter, and I dealt with many weeks on that word mortify, putting to death sins in our life. Romans 8.13 tells us that if we don't put things to death in our life, we're going to, in other words, become slave to those and not be able to live unto God. Hebrews 12.1, in, in, in talking about Christ's death upon the cross, he said that one of the things that we uh, that we need to do is we need to put aside the sin that doth so easily beset us. And the way that you can do that is by looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. He set God through the penman of Hebrews says that because of what Jesus did on the cross, you and I should put away the sins that put Him on the cross. Right. Let me say this, and this statement, and I'm done. They killed Jesus for our sin. It's about time that every single one of us start putting, start killing our sins for Jesus. They killed, our, they killed Jesus for our sin. We need to start putting to death, killing our sin for Jesus.
That's what this text tells us about. There's things that we will always fight that should have been killed long ago. Israel still fought these Canaanites and these Perizzites for many years down the road because when they should have been utterly destroyed, they made compromises based on what they saw, based on fear, based on the wrong focus, and based even on financial contributions. And they gave, they gave way to God's Word and let those people that were ungodly and, and idolatrous live in their land. And they constantly were a thorn in their side. And they were fighting battles they never should have fought. You know, one of the biggest things that will keep you from going forward for the cause of Christ is from getting another victory uh, in your spiritual life is fighting the same battles over and over and over again instead of putting those things to death and moving forward and fighting new enemies and going against the new onslaught of the devil. See, the devil doesn't have to give us new enemies to fight because so many of us fail to put to death that which is in front of us, our flesh, and the other enemies that he sends our way, those other fiery darts. He sends, we'll spend our whole life, Brother Lewis, fighting those same, same battles. And we're so busy fighting the same battles, we're never able to go forward when God wants us to go forward. How are you going to go forward in the fight? You need to do that which is appropriate. You need to put to death the things that need to be put to death, the sins that just so easily beset us because Jesus died for it, because He was killed for it. You and I ought to kill it for Him. You and I ought to do it in honor to Him for what He did on the cross. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to see some folks get some victory tonight. Amen. Let's stop fighting the same battles. Let's go forward for the cause of Christ. Let's let God uh, move us forward. Let's let Him be with us. Let's take a new ground for the honor and the glory of God in this late hour. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed, everybody standing across the building. If you need to come forward, these altars are open.